In this video, I'm going to analyze the pinning statistics from the 2023 NCAA Championships. Let's kick it off with some numbers. There were 640 total matches at NCAAs across the 10 different weight classes. And yes, I was crazy enough to watch every single one of them. Of those 640 total matches, 62 or 9.7% resulted in a fall, the official term for a pin. If you're interested in seeing the pins from the 2023 NCAAs, I have a 28 minute video available to supporters of the channel that features all 62 of them, which includes timestamps showing the pinner and the technique used, as well as a spreadsheet of all the pins. Which technique do you think resulted in the most falls? The answer is unequivocal. Cradles were the most successful pinning technique, accounting for 15 falls. This means that 24%, or roughly a quarter of all pins, came from cradles. Of these 15 pins via cradle, 12 came from near side cradles, and 3 came from far side cradles. Near side cradles, where you lock your hands over the head and around the leg, can be cinched from neutral positions, and because of this, are generally the most accessible form of cradle. Entries for nearside cradles from 2023 NCAAs were front headlocks, single legs, and while defending leg attacks. Farside cradles, where you lock your hands under the head and around the leg, are generally used when you are behind an opponent in the top position and were much less prevalent than near side cradles. Two of the three far side cradles were locked up from top position. The other was off a scramble where Jaden Abbas converted a leg pass to a far side cradle. Cradles are particularly effective because once cinched, they are difficult to escape from and can quickly turn a seemingly contested position into a near fall or match ending pin. There is no other pinning technique that I am aware of that offers the same degree of versatility accessibility, and power as a cradle. This brings us to another interesting stat. Of the 62 total pins, 39 of them, or 63%, came from a move initiated from the neutral position. Contrast this with the 16 pins, or 26%, that came from a move initiated from the top position. Said another way, the pin was more than twice as likely to occur from a move initiated from neutral position than it was from a move initiated from top position. So if 63% of pins came from a neutral position and 26% came from top position, what about the other 11%? That 11% can be accounted for by the seven pins that came off moves initiated from bottom position. These were typically moves in which a bottom person's reversal directly led to the fall. Brian Soldano from Rutgers actually had two pins that came off moves initiated not only from bottom position, but from his own back. There was also one defensive fall by Malik Hines. What are we to make of the fact that there were significantly fewer pins from top position than neutral position? In theory at least, a wrestler starting in top position against an opponent on both knees in the referee's position is closer to pinning their opponent than a wrestler in neutral position. But a review of all the pins showed that there were only 13 pins that came from conventional turns from top position. Five from arm bar variations, a classic barbed wire turn by Wyatt Hendrickson, who had the most pins at 2023 NCAAs with three, a cement job, two far side cradles, a half Nelson, a slick hammerlock variation, two suckbacks, and a whip over. Three other pins that came from top position, but I would not consider conventional top turns, were this one from Casey Swiderski, where he acted like he was going to cut the opponent, then jumped on the cement mixer, and two rolls from the bottom person gone wrong. Moving back to pins that resulted from moves initiated from the neutral position, one stat that jumps out is that there were 29 pins from the neutral position 
that came from either a nearside cradle or a throw. In other words, 47% or nearly half of all pins from 2023 NCAAs came from a nearside cradle or some kind of throwing technique that was initiated from the neutral position. Breaking this figure down further, this includes 12 nearside cradles and 17 throws. We've already discussed the potency of cradles. Now let's talk about throws, which by themselves accounted for 27% of all pins at 2023 NCAAs. The beauty of a successful throw is that the thrower will oftentimes land in a chest-on-chest -chest position with strong upper body grips that can help facilitate the pin. Whether a throw will turn into a pin, legendary pinner Wade Shallis calls these terminal takedowns, is usually determined by whether the thrower can stabilize top position in the second or two immediately after landing on the mat. Sometimes the momentum of the throw will give the bottom wrestler an opportunity to escape or even reverse the position. But provided that the thrower is able to stabilize the top position after landing, the thrower then has the benefit of inertia on their side. I mentioned earlier how there were relatively few pins that were initiated from the top position. I suspect a big part of this is that high level division one wrestlers are generally very difficult to turn from the bottom position. For the top wrestler to turn them, they will often need to break them down off their knees and or get some kind of dominant controls like a bar, cradle, or half nelson. The problem is that skilled bottom wrestlers are very good at stopping all of these things and are proficient at both preventing and working their way out of pinning techniques. I mentioned inertia earlier. This is the idea that things in a given state tend to remain that way. When a bottom wrestler starts in the referee's position, getting them from here to on their back takes a ton of work. Inertia in this case works for the benefit of the bottom wrestler. Now going back to a successful throw from the neutral position, the thrower who lands with his opponent already on his back and with good upper body controls becomes the beneficiary of inertia. The bottom wrestler is now the one who needs to change the situation, while the top wrestler just needs to maintain the status quo. Let's take a look at the throws to pins at 2023 NCAAs. As you're watching, keep in mind this idea of inertia and notice how the throw immediately puts the top wrestler in an excellent position to facilitate the pin. Breaking down the throws to pins by technique, there were six instances of cement jobs and cement mixer variations. This included two flying cement mixers. There was a fireman's carry by Will Feldkamp. There were two headlocks. There was a cool lat whip by Hendrickson to win third place. There was this overhook body lock twisting throw by Colton Schultz. It will probably come as no surprise that Schultz is a highly credentialed Greco-Roman wrestler. There was this Tayatoshi twisting throw by Bryce Andonian, which was probably my favorite throw of the tournament. There were four whip over variations, including two from Chris Foca that I covered in depth in this video. There was a wizard kick. And of course, there was this memorable head pinch to whip overthrow by Matt Ramos against Spencer Lee, resulting in maybe the biggest upset in NCAA history. I also cover this one more in depth in the FOCA video. There were only two pins that came from pure leg attacks, both off double legs and both on the same guy. This figure does not include the singles that transition to near side cradles, and also doesn't include hybrid leg and upper body attacks like this fireman's carry we saw earlier, or this underhook ankle pick. The last thing I want to talk about is the Turk position. There were five pins that came from variations of the Turk, which is when the top wrestler hooks or traps the bottom wrestler's bottom leg, which keeps them broken down to a hip and prevents them from hip heisting and building up their base. Two of these were what I'll call 50-50 Turk positions because they resemble the 50-50 position in BJJ. These ones resulted from the defending wrestler attempting a leg pass and the top wrestler putting weight onto their past leg and maintaining forward pressure to lock them in place. This one from Aaron Nagao started as a leg split, then became a Turk when he hooked and elevated the opponent's left leg. The hooked leg plus the cross face prevented the opponent from hip heisting. Nagao then transitioned to a bow and arrow by grabbing the other leg. 
grapevine the leg he had initially turked and got the pin in what might have been the most brutal pinning sequence of the tournament. Jacob Warner likewise had a leg split that became a turk. He also used a cross face and a bow and arrow to help get the fall. Speaking of brutal pinning sequences, NCAA champ Andrew Alirez used a really cool turk variation when he crossed the opponent's left ankle across his other thigh, trapped the ankle against Alirez's left hip, got the cross face, and crossed his own ankles. That's it for this one. If you would like to support my work, please consider becoming a member through Patreon or YouTube memberships. Supporters have access to a number of members-only videos, such as my recent series analyzing Adam Satia's 2000 Olympic Championship run. Thanks for watching.